And here's an example of finding um, the critical numbers for a function, which are the numbers where the derivative is either zero or does not exist, and then using those to find local, uh, otherwise known as relative minima and maxima, and also finding absolute maxima and minima. So here's the function. 2x cubed minus 1 half x squared minus x plus 2. And let's do that on the interval from minus 1 to 1. That's a comma. And there's a theorem that guarantees that there will definitely be an absolute maximum for this function because it's a continuous function. So let me write that down. Um, note f is continuous on this interval. So there definitely is an absolute max and an absolute min. Now, where those are, we have to f actually figure it out. Well, let me go ahead and um, we, we, since I'm on the computer, I could graph this right away and get some quick and dirty answers um, pretty quickly. But let's, let's imagine that we don't have the computer yet to be able to do this. And so we're going to use the fact that we know that an absolute max or an absolute min, there's only a few ways for those to happen. Absolute max, for example, can only be where the function is going up and turning around. That's if it's in the, inner, inter, the inside, the interior of the interval. Or it could just be at the end point of the interval if it happens to be going up as it hits that end point, and then it doesn't have an opportunity to go down again. So what that means is we're going to look for critical numbers. That's where f prime of x equals 0, or f prime of x does not exist. And, and also check the endpoints. So the also check the endpoints part is really simple. Just don't forget to do it. It doesn't take any effort. Just don't forget that you have to do it. So let's look for the critical numbers first. So f prime of x, we're going to take the derivative. It's going to be 6x squared minus x minus 1. And we want to set that equal to 0. OK. And I purposely picked one where it's not as easily factorable as a lot of these examples. We could go ahead and try to do some clever factoring here. Or we could go ahead and use the quadratic formula. And I love to have examples where they make you use the quadratic formula. Usually, when they make you use the quadratic formula, the answers are really nasty. But I made sure the answers weren't too bad here. So minus b is 1, plus or minus the square root of 1 minus 4ac. So that's minus 4 times minus 1 times 6, all over 12, 2a. And so that's going to be 1 plus or minus the square root of, and voila, that's 25, so that's 5 all over 12. So 1 plus 5 over 12, that's going to be plus 1 half. And 1 minus 5 over 12 is minus 1 third. So in fact, that tells us that 6x squared minus x minus 1, if we had tried to factor it, it's 6 times x minus something times x minus something else. Well, those the, what, it's, what the, we want to plug in there are the 1 half and the minus 1 third. So you can check if you want that this is how it would have factored if we had been clever enough to do that. But the quadratic formula is a pretty awesome way to, to see that anyway. So we've got our places where the derivative is equal to 0. Now we're going to encounter examples later where we have to be careful to check also for where the derivative does not exist. But here, um, f is differentiable everywhere since it's a polynomial. So there won't be DNEs, no DNEs for the derivative. OK, so now we just have to plug in um, to figure out what's going on with the absolute max and absolute min. 
we just have to plug in all the candidates. So f of 1 half, let me redo that. It's going to look prettier. There we go. f of 1 half, we're just going to plug that in. So that's 2 times 1 half cubed, which is 2 over 8 minus 1 half times 1 half squared, which is 1 over 8, and then minus a half, which is 4 over 8, and then plus, well, 2 is 16 over 8. I'm just going, ahead, going ahead and putting it all over a common denominator. And so we've got 18 minus 5, so we've got 13 eighths. Hopefully that's correct. And then f of minus one third, that's going to be a little bit more of a pain to calculate, but we'll just again put it over a common denominator. That's going to be minus two twenty sevenths minus one over eighteen plus one third plus two. So now let's do the common denominator. It's fifty-four. So minus four fifty-fourths minus uh, three fifty-fourths plus eighteen fifty-fourths plus one oh eight fifty-fourths is let's see. One twenty six, one nineteen over fifty four, and the other two candidates are the endpoints. F of minus one. And that's pretty easy. F of my, we just plug in minus one into our original function, and we get minus two. minus a half, scroll back up, plus one plus two. And so that's just one half, because some of that cancels out. And f of one, that's pretty easy. That's just the sum of the coefficients. That's four, three, two point five. Two and five halves. That's five halves. So we found the critical numbers. Those are exactly the x's that have, make the derivative zero. We've found the values of f, the heights at those critical numbers. And now we can find the absolute max min by just taking the biggest of those values. Well, 119 over 54 is not quite as big as 5 halves. Um, and 13 over 8 is a bit smaller than everything, except it's not as small as 1 half. So in fact, in this example, the absolute maximum are just at the endpoints. And let's confirm that by graphing this function. Let me pull this back down here. So if we graph this thing, uh, let's make it a, the right interval. We can see that here's the 1 half that we start at. Here's the max, uh, the, the lo a local max here, which is f of minus 1, 3. That's the 119 over 54. And then here's the, uh, what turns out to be a relative min. That's the 13 eighths here. And then it goes up to 2.5 over here. So what we can figure, what this part of the story that we could easily figure out so far with the calculus that we know is where, what are the x and y values of these uh, critical numbers, the, these what, what you call stationary points. If you call them stationary points if the derivative is 0, if it's not a DNE. I, I like to call them good critical points, things where things are nicely behaved. We figured out the x uh, values by setting the derivative equal to 0. We figured out the y values by plugging that back into the function. And we've actually done that before when we interpreted this as like position versus time. 
These were the turnarounds. That's nothing new. And then the only thing we're, we were doing in addition to that is plugging in the endpoints and, see, and comparing them and seeing if those are bigger or smaller than everything. In this case, it turns out that the maximum of the function is just on the right-hand side and the minimum is on the left-hand side. What's a little hard to figure out without looking at the graph is just given these two points, or just one of these points, like the x equals 1 half and y equals 13 eighths, we know it's a stationary point, but is it a local max? Is it a local min? Is it neither? That's where we're going to have to do a little bit more work, and that's what four, four point, uh, section 4.3 is about. But for what you're doing tonight, this should be uh, pretty good.